Right, it's uh, great to be here. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah. Right, I would just like to um, thank um, Anthony Beckett and his wife Rachel as well for putting on the conference. Um, I'm going to time myself, so I'm just going to switch on my stopwatch now so that we are on time. Okay, um, I'll just introduce myself very briefly. I'm the author of the book. Um, sorry, I'm the author of the book, *The Murder of Reality: Hidden Symbolism of the Dragon*. <laughs> Primarily, it's an etymological study on the nature of um, the serpent agena, which uh, refers to the serpent race. And so, I study um, subjects such as the fallen angels, um, the jinn, and I particularly go into um, a field which I have labelled as illuminotics. Now, illuminotics is the study um, of the symbols of the illuminati. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. We're principally going to be looking at the symbolism of the Illuminati. So, um, first of all, um, today's lecture, it's divided into four sections. So we're just going to quickly um, have an overview of what the lecture is about today. Um, actually, first of all, the title of the lecture is Angels, Aliens, Dragons and Gods. And I'm going to be arguing um, that the, um, the, the etymology suggests, or the, in terms of linguistics... Um, there is this suggestion that the angels, um, they are one and the same thing with the phenomenon of the aliens. And I can prove this, and I will be demonstrating this today when we deconstruct um, the words um, for the terms of angels and, and aliens, etc. I'm also going to be um, drawing an analogy with the dragon as well. Um, this refers to the symbolism of the dragon. So the dragon is an identifier of the seraphim, the seraphim being a seraph or a type of angel. Um, also, in relation to this, uh, we can also see that the gods themselves, that within the ancient languages, there was very little distinction between a god, a jinn, and an angel. The, this terminology is much more closer than what it is today. So... First of all, we're going to just quickly now go into the four sections of today's lecture. So, first of all, we'll look at UFOs in the biblical and apocrypha tradition. Now, the apocrypha comes from the word um, um, acalypso, which is um, the unveiling. Okay? The apocrypha is something which is um, veiled, so this is veiled li um, literature. Um, so we'll look at the Apocrypha and the Biblical traditions. Um, we're also going to look at the idea that the angels are sailors. And this is important when we review this in material um, to UFOlogy. Um, because traditionally, um, there's a lot of scholars saying, well, you know, the UFO is just a modern, postmodern construct. And it, it refers to a technological age in terms of um, a technological society trying to describe mystical experiences. And this is not true. I'm going to be arguing today that the UFO itself... The idea of a vessel and aliens visiting is a very ancient concept, and this is actually encoded within the language and the literature. Um, number three, uh, we'll look at the signifier of the dragon. Uh, the dragon primarily is a signifier of a deity, and therefore is interlinked both in terms of the seraphim, or the serpentagena, or the anguagena, as they were known in the Latin. In the Arabic, they are referred to the jinn, and I'm going to be making the argument that the angels and the jinn are very closely related species. I know that Islamic scholars um, tend to separate them and say that the two species are not related, um, but early Islamic scholars certainly did not make this um, type of distinction. And finally, I'm going to analyse the angel from a linguistic and symbolic perspective and demonstrate that this being is the same type of entity as a grey alien. So first of all, I just want to... Um uh, first of all, I just want to look at a common misconception first of all, and then we're going to build upon this uh, misconception and, and try and straighten things out a little bit for us, because it's, it's obviously important for us in terms of how we use terminology. So I'm going to quote, um, I'm going to quote from uh, Nick Pope's own book, The Uninvited, and this is what he writes. He says, I am not tied to the acceptance that the abductors are necessarily extraterrestrials. Um, far more importantly, it removes the requirement and, uh, that the experience involves a spacecraft. This is crucial because the concept of a spacecraft has only existed for a century or so, starting with the science fiction works of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. This is just not true. Okay? Um, while human encounters with non-human intelligences have been going on, I believe throughout history, in other words, any definition of abduction that is couched in modern terms probably excludes 99% of the phenomenon. Okay, I, I think intellectually this is an interesting argument, and this obviously comes from um, researchers um, such as Jacques Vallée, who looked at the idea that the, uh, this is a controlled structure and that these are interdimensional beings. 
Uh, but just because a being is interdimensional, this does not mean that these beings are not physical, because obviously the human being is an interdimensional being. We have a soul, we have a spirit. Again, the soul and the spirit are very distinct. Um, but we are interdimensional beings as well. So here we are primarily dealing with physical be beings, and I think the argument also is that we are dealing with technological beings. So, um, so I'm just going to put forward the idea that the interpretation that the spaceship um, is a recent concept is refutable, and in this lecture I will give evidence to establish the opposite idea and prove that vehicles, specifically ships, are an ancient concept that are viewed to arise from an alien intelligence venerated in scripture as a deity. So this is a very important theme. So to demonstrate, first of all, the major connection, I want to um, have a look at the Aramaic etymology for an, um, for an, alien, um, for, sorry, for an angel, because this is very revealing. In the um, Aramaic language, the term Zari refers to an angel. But this is a polymorphic word. It has an additional meaning. It also means an alien, stranger, or visitor. So in other words, uh, when they were talking about um, angels in the Aramaic and in the Bible, uh, they were not just talking about angels or messengers, but they were also referring to al aliens. And the etymology is re related to Sar, which is a naval captain designating technically a prince of the angelic host. And indeed, Yahweh Sabaoth, uh, the lord of the host, is referred to as a prince or a captain of the naval host. And we find references for this, um, for example, in the book of um, Joshua, chapter 5, verse um, 15. Um, so, etymologically, Zarian, an angel or an alien, is interrelated with Sira, which is a boat. So, these entities actually um, are derived or originate from a type of vessel or boat. So the supposition that angels and aliens are part of an identical control structure is a controversy that will challenge many in the audience today. Uh, but I contend that within this synopsis, I'm going to um, show that there are important clues to the alien phenomenon um, which are embedded in arcane symbolism in context of the manipulation of language and culture. So I'm going to be saying today that it's, it, um, it, it's important to understand this phenomenon. We have to go into occult symbolism and we have to look at etymology and we have to look at, look at the study of linguistics. This is the only way in which we can begin to see um, um, the, the leaves are... Um, this is the only way that we can begin to actually review this phenomenon. So this is um, very important. So essentially the definition of an, a, um, a, an angel referred to in the apocrypha tradition as a watcher is identical to a dragon. And this is an idea that I'm going to be highlighting. So when I refer to a dragon, this is interrelated um, to the idea of a seraphim or a type of angel. Um, so the dragon personifies um, a deity, a seraphim. These are all interconnected. Um, and in terms of the jinn, this is interconnected to the study of the jinn as well because the jinn can manifest um, as a serpent or a dragon. So textual evidence for this assertion uh, will be taken from the Testament of Amran, which during the course of this lecture we shall carefully deconstruct. Significantly, the angel, alternatively a watcher, now these two terms are um, synonymous, so therefore the Greek word drakon means to watch um, or to flash, and indeed a sentinel is referred to as a type of um, seraphim, shaft, which is the verb to see. So a watcher is a type of dragon or is a type of um, angel. And these beings are featured within the ancient tradition, and they are referred to specifically as sailors, and is a name which is compared to a deity. Now to illustrate this point throughout the Bible, um, I want to look at the name of Yahweh, who was also referred to as Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the host. So, uh, number one, to quote the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Uh, number two, um, this is from the prophet Amos, the Lord of hosts is his name. And here we have a depiction of the Lord of the host. And I think this is very interesting in terms of symbolism, in terms of what actually it represents. Because, first of all, we have this um, circular or eclipt, um, elliptical shape, which superficially looks like a UFO. But I would argue to, to you that the um, painter is actually making a biblical reference to the Ophanim. Now, the Ophanim are, are generally translated as a class of angel. Um, but the Ophanim means um, those belonging to the wheels or the circular ones. And the Ophanim refers to a, specifically to an angelic vessel. Because, as we said before, the Lord of the host is a type of sailor. A sailor that, sh uh, that sails in a ship or a vessel. Now, in the Bible, there are over 300 references to the Lord of the host. In a literal sense, the Lord is a commander of a naval retinue. 
um, his crew members are represented as angels and are featured as mariners and is encoded in the Hebrew word Malak an angel, a synonym of Malak a sailor. So the definition of an angel is ultimately tied into the name or into the encoding of um, the Hebrew god Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the host. And just to quickly comment on this image, we also see that this elliptical shape um, looks superficially like an eye. So therefore, this would refer to drakos, uh, which is the Greek word for an eye, the classical word in the Greek, uh, which is identified with a sentinel or, or a seraphim, um, a, a drakon. So we're seeing that there are these, um, the symbols themselves is very complex and it's actually very layered. So um, just to look at this image also, we can see, um, that this uh, image, um, which it presumably is of, uh, within the Kabbalistic traditions, um, the, uh, the royal fraternity, or, or the prince, um, is often re um, viewed as originating from this angelic or alien bloodline. As we said, the two terms are synonymous. So therefore, in Kabbalistic philosophy, we have Ben Sera, which is the son of a boat, which in doublespeak means an angel. And we see also this um, halo, which is traditionally a, a solar device, but the um, Greek word halos, which is a halo, is a polymorphic word. It means salt. And when we render this into the Hebrew, we find that the word melak, which is salt, it, it, it's a pun on, on the word malak, which is an angel. So the halo itself is actually signifying this um, angelic um, offspring, which is deemed a, as alien, strange, unusual, and is uh, non-human or angelic. So, in the scriptures, the titular Yahweh Lord is adjunct as the Boeth. Now, Yahweh actually means an entity, and if we've got time, we'll be going into this in, in, in more detail. So, Yahweh Saboeth is the Lord of the host. He is literally a crew of a naval vessel, and we'll prove this in a moment. Now, the appellation Saboeth host is from the original root, Sevet, a crew, and specifies Teba, an ark, or a vessel. In Latin, the translation Saboeth is rendered as hostess and denotes the angelic host. Um, specifically a foreign or an invasive force. So, in other words, Yahweh Sabaoth is equated in the Latin language with an alien or an invasive force. This is an external force which is external to human experience, for the most part. Now, in the Judaic tradition, the angels are likened to, likened to sailors, literally crew members of vessels, and are, by very definition, similar in the modern context to an alien and their flying craft referred to variously as UFOs. And I think we need to emphasise this and, and draw a comparison between the occult tradition, which is essentially uh, representing the same phenomenon, um, and um, this um, alien tradition, which is the modern or the contemporary idiom. And I want to just go over the um, vocabulary, because we can establish this. I'm not just saying to you, oh, well, gosh, yeah, you, well, you know what, the angels, yeah, they're aliens. It's a no-brainer. I'm actually saying to you um, that we can prove this linguistically through the study of um, ancient languages. So, for example, we see on the screen here, we have Malak, an angel, which is identified with Malak, a sailor. It's a polymorphic word. And this is primarily how the occult communicates to one another. It's through polymorphic language and wordplay. Underneath, we have Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of the Host. Sabaoth literally means a crew of a vessel. In, in the Latin, it's rendered as host, which is a type of army or an invasive army, an alien army. But Sabaoth is identified in the Hebrew with Sevet, a crew, and Tebe, an ark. So, um, in the Latin, we have hostis, which is the angelicos, specifically an alien or an invasive army. Again, we have the uh, signifier here in, on the etching on the left-hand side of Mercury, the god, who was a messenger god, Alaka, which is um, the Arabic word to send a message, presumably where the etymology for Malak comes from, which is a type of messenger. We have the double caduceus, which is a serpent, which is, represents a seraphim. The C here is a signifier of, um, the, of the angel, because as I said before, um, in the Greek, the term halos salt, which is represented by the halo, um, is identified with halios, um, which is a type of fisherman, and the fisherman is a symbol of the sailor. So we see here that the symbolism, it, that there's a cross comparison of the symbolism. Um, so, and in summary then, the angels are considered as sailors or our crew members, and what is more, in both the modern and ancient tradition, the angel is regarded as foreign or alien and is non-human in appearance. In other words, they are typically, not always, but typically are represented as serpents or dragons, and the theme of the dragon keeps on appearing within occult symbolism. 
Now, typically these strange entities, um, as I said, were represented as dragons or seraphs, um, but they are also compatible with what we would describe with the Hebrew term for an angel. So we see that there is this crossover between the dragon, which is a type of watcher or a sentinel, and the understanding that this dragon is a type of deity. And I want to just um, also show this, um, impress this upon the audience. So, for example, when we look at the symbolism of the seraphim, uh, where we'd get the word seraph for a fiery serpent from Serepha, which is fire, but we see etymologically it's related to sap on a sailor and safina a ship. Um, and we see this association also within um, um, the, in the esoteric tradition. So, for example, we have the seraphim here, um, which is on an early etching, I think from about the 1600s. Um, it's, um, it's attached to an anchor, so this is a reference to the seraphim or, or the sailors. Um, but as we can see here, we, we can see that the um, apparel or the clothing of the hands, which are, um, are making this type of pact or some type of covenant, um, but this is a visio paranomasia pun. In other words, this is a visual pun of the clouds. Now, what does the cloud represent? Well, the cloud in the Latin represents the nubagina, those who are born from the clouds, the offspring of the clouds. Now, when we render this back within, to the, within the Aramaic and the Hebrew language, we have the Elohim, which are the equivalent to the nubagina. The Elohim are those, um, the Elohim means lofty ones, those who are high. Sometimes the terminology is um, translated as the shining ones. So the cloud signifies the Elohim or the nubagina. So the semantic relationship then between the seraphim and Sapanasela is identical to Saboath, the angelic host describing a crew. And etymologically, Saboath host is a name that infers Sopheth, a watcher. And as we said before, the term watcher in the Greek refers to Dracon from Dracos and I. It's a metonym which is used to denote a type of seraphim or a type of deity. Now, the resemblance between the watcher and dragon is important as it links into the definition of the host represented as a sailor or an angel. So we'll just quickly look at this. Yahweh Saboth is the Lord of the host. Sopheth, identified with the watcher or the seraphim. Saboth is the angelic host, literally a crew of a vessel. Sevet, a crew, Tebe, an ark. But uh, um, throughout occult symbolism, the eye is an important symbol, and it represents the seraphim, represents the dragon, and it, and it represents the deity, the, um, the godhead, which increasingly is associated with these entities, whether it's within um, traditional monolithic um, religions, such as Islam, or within the New Age, because all of this material is coming from the same source. And indeed, I would argue, even within Satanism, the eye is a prominent feature, because these entities are controlling the discourse. Fundamentally, they're controlling the language that we use. And I would argue to the audience today that human languages and the scripts of human languages um, has been intercepted. They have insinuated themselves through the words and through the language that we use. And therefore, this is how they control us, fundamentally through the way that we think. So, um, the connection between the watcher and a dragon now, we can prove this also within textual evidence also. And it's, um, so, we've proven it linguistically, but we can also prove it through the Apocrypha scriptures as well, those scriptures which have been hidden. So, for example, in the Testament of Amran, fragment 1, retrieved from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've, um, sorry, just... Interesting, we'll just go back, we'll go back to that slide in a moment. So, um, the Testament of Amran, um, he said, I saw watchers in my vision, and I asked them, what are you? And they answered and said unto me, we have been made to rule over the masters, and, uh, to, we have been made masters and rule over all of the sons of man. I raised my eyes and saw one of them, his looks were frightening like those of a viper. So we are instantly told within um, this short paragraph that the watchers themselves are identified with serpents, with um, the seraphim. And again, I have an image here of a uh, a type of angelic being. He's holding a shield. Uh, now, the Greek word shield, opalon, is where we get the word etymology for pleon, a boat, because the shields were put on the side of the boats. The shield is an ancient device of the um, Ophanim, which were the angelic order, which were identified with vessels, circular vessels in particular. Um, so, this is implicit of an angelic vessel, and it's often used within symbolism to denote this as well. I just want to go back to my previous slide because I just want to make the quick connection between Saba lizard, um, identified in Arabic with Saba, which is the host, and Suban, a large snake. So these are word plays on um, the dragon. And again, we see that um, this is displayed with, um, for example, 
uh, within symbolism and iconography. So, for example, the seraphim is depicted with the watching eye. The watching eye is a symbol of the seraphim or the dragon or a type of deity. Um, and I also just want to show the etymological connection between the seraphim, which, as I said, is the ice class of angel, and shaf, which is the verb to see, obviously related to seraph, a snake, sap, and a sailor, safina, a ship. Now, going back to um, Amran's text, uh, according to Amran, the masters that rule over all of man are non-human in appearance, and in addition, as we have noted, the watcher, variously an angel or sailor, is identified with a dragon or seraph, and is terrifying to behold. Okay, so, but we find references to these entities also in the Bible, so this isn't just something that, oh, well, well the Apocrypha was all lies, and, um, and so that was all concealed and put away. But we're finding this also within the biblical tradition as well. So the idea that a deity is awe-inspiring is an important thread coincident throughout religious iconography, to quote the Old Testament, Judges chapter 13, verse 6. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Um, Malach Elohim in the original, in the original Semitic. Very terrible. Uh, now here we have a Ubaid figurine. And this is quite interesting, because this figurine here represents the jinn. How do we know this? Well, the Palestinian word for a jinn is shedim, collectively. Um, singular shed, which is a ghost, goblin, ghoul. Notice the word goblin. Um, but the, there's a word play here. So the shedim, or the shed, because in the singular, is identified with shad, which is a breast. The breast being the human um, angelic component, because as I said before, a descendant of a boat is typically represented as an angel, or is related to the human angelic lineage. Hence the connection between Malak and Angel, Melak a king. In English we would say kingship. In Greek they would say Arkos a ruler and Ukos which is a large vessel. These terms are synonymous. So um, we see in the Bible um, that the countenance of an angel is terrifying. So in the same vein as in the Apocrypha tradition, the biblical texts adhere to the odd belief that the angels are terrible or frightening in appearance. In the book of Judges, the watcher is referred to as a Malak Elohim, an angel of God, and like the testament of Amran, is said to be in inhuman. Significantly, in this text, the designation Malak, an angel, is equated with an Elohim, a god or a deity, suggesting that the original text that the angels are considered are, are likened to be, um, to be like God. So this terminology between the deities and the angels is very much blurred within the ancient Semitic. And it, of course this relates to the alien phenomenon as we know it, because they're using very similar language and terminology. Now, the scribal magistrate records the word Malak Elohim as terrible and is an adjective based upon the primary root yare to be afraid or to fear. Esoteric, the Hebrew verb yare is used to connote the psychological reaction of fear and is an effective pundigrian on the name Yahweh Lord. So they're using wordplay here. Now, the implication is that Yahweh is a type of seraph, the noun seraph, a cognate of the old Semitic verb raf, uh, which is terror, and is the same type of entity as a fallen angel or a demon. And in, indeed, the Greek word demon or daemon is often translated as the word jinn. Um, I know that they're typically seen as auspicious entities, um, but there is also a, a darker side to this phenomenon as well. So the connection between a deity and a daemon and their association with fear is established in the Hellenistic languages. We'll go over that in a moment. I just quickly want to draw your attention so you can see this on the screen, so you can digest this for yourselves. But essentially, Yahweh God, literally an entity, because this is what the word breaks down as, um, is equated to Yare, which is to be afraid or fear. And we can see the connection with the seraphim, with seraph an angel or a snake, raf terror. Again, we're seeing that the angelic uh, seraphim is identified with the eye, which is a symbol of Dracos, which is the dragon. He's standing on the wheel, which is an identifier of the Ophanim. The Ophanim are the circular ones, um, and it equates to a type of angelic vehicle. So, in the Greek, the analogy of Yahweh, Lord, and Yare, fear, is demonstrated in the polyglottal pun. So, th this is a terminology that I've come up with to describe these types of puns. Puns which translate into multiple different languages. So, the pun is translated as Theos God and Dios Dread. In essence, the word association is identical to a daemon, a supernatural entity, a cognate of daemos sphere. So, the etymology for fear identified with God is also the same as with the daemon. That word is translated 
translated into the Arabic as a jinn. Uh, we might also note that the Greek word daemon appears in many Arabic translations as a jinn. Old Semitic gen, a serpent or a worm. So the connection with the serpent or worm is once again reinforced uh, with the jinn and indicates a correspondence between a degenerate angel in the context outlined as seraphim or a seraph and their fallen state, the jinn. In a literal sense, a degenerate angel is an angel that has mutineered, uh, mutineered from a vessel. So the correlation between fear and the deity are summarised in the following word lists. I'll just quickly go over these lists so you can see the comparison between the Semitic and the Greek. Yahweh God, greater to Yare, to be afraid or fear. Theos God, Dios dread. Seraphim is a variation on wrath, old Semitic word for terror. Daemon, a super type of um, entity. Daemos, fear. Remember that the daemon is translated as a jinn from jana to hide or to conceal, identified with um, jen, which which is the old Semitic word for a serpent. And again, the correlation with the serpent and that which is hidden is demonstrated in the Arabic um, terminology, Afra viper, related to kafa, which is fear. So, so examination of the... Um, just let me have a look. So, examination of the... Um, Examination of the etymological data gives strong circumstantial evidence that the deity in the Semitic tradition referred to as Yahweh Seboeth, the Lord of the Host, is a type of daemon or a jinn. And I'm going to try and um, substantiate this argument um, um, throughout the course of this lecture. Um, and it's a classification which is grouped with a deity, angel, seraph, or a sailor. These terms are synonymous. Um, generally, we can note that the angel's appearance is considered as alien or different, for example, terrifying, and is a comparison which is substantiated in modern cases equated with human-alien interactions in which the entity is perceived as strange or different in appearance. So I have a st stereotypical alien here. Obviously, the emphasis is on the eyes, which is an occult symbol of the dragon. Um, and these entities in both accounts, whether we're dealing with angels or we're dealing with aliens, they're both equated with vessels, specifically ships. So the idea that the gods are reptilian and repugnant to look at is not just found within the Judaic tradition, but is in fact much older. For example, evidence of the non-human gods are found in the writings of Apollodorus, 4th century BC, who documented the traditions of the Babylonian fish deity in the translations of Semitic texts. In his accounts, collated from the priest Barosus, he refers to the Anadoti, a race of aquatic beings that, come, that came from heaven and is said to have given man knowledge, including the institution of society, laws, governance, writing and astrology. So in essence these entities gave, gave us knowledge, they gave us culture, they gave us our language, they gave us um, our ability to describe ourselves, to understand ourselves. Now the scholar Robert Temple, who I personally regard very highly, in his excellent book The Serious Mystery, notes that the name Anecdoti is a derivation from Anecdotus, the repulsive ones, and are worshipped throughout the Middle East. So essentially these are very similar um, to, the, um, uh, to the Seraphim or to the Daemon. Um, it's a curious name. Why would you, a deity which is venerated, why would you refer to that type of deity as the repulsive one? I will tell you why, because it actually describes the physical characteristics of the physical appearance of this type of angelic being. So the traditions of the Anadoti, a type of deity, they are depicted originally as amphibian and are equated with a teacher of secret knowledge and is very similar, I would argue, to, in the Judaic theology to an angelic being. Um, in particular, the seraphim angels act as seraph a serpent. As demonstrated earlier, the seraphim is equated with Sapan a sailor, a class of being that originates from Safina, a ship. These entities are identical with Malak an angel and Malak um, a mariner or a sailor. So just to quickly look, um, deconstruct uh, this slide, we see here that um, the um, seraphim's mouth is actually purposely represented as a type of vessel because it's working on the wordplay seraphim and safina, which is a ship or a vessel. Again, in the fallen state, the seraphim are identified with the jinn, specifically the shedim, or shed, which is a ghost, goblin, or ghoul. Um, related to the Arabic word, um, sauda, meaning black, so the jinn is often represented as um, something which is black. Um, and there is this correlation with the serpent or the shining one. Remember the um, Erin in the, in the Semitic means a watcher, but it also means a shining one. And it's identified um, with um, the Elohim. Um, it's an, etym um, an etymological cognate. So examination of... Um, 
Examination of the etymological data gives strong circumstantial evidence that the deity in the Semitic traditions referred to as Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of the Host, is a type of daemon or a jinn, a classification which is grouped with a deity, angel, seraph or a sailor. And these are cat cat categorizations which I would argue within Judaism and Islam, um, they have been desperate to try and distance themselves from this. And the discourses between, let's say, the pagan Arabs and between Mohammed always centered on this um, idea um, that the angels and, and that God God was um, related to um, this type of phenomenon, and uh, Muhammad was very careful to distance that idea. But again, I think there is a very persuasive argument, and I'm going to try and present some of these um, argumentations. So generally, we can note that the angel's appearance is considered as alien or different, for example, terrifying. Um, and it's substantiated in modern cases equated with human interactions in which the entity is perceived as strange or different in appearance. Um, the entities are typically correlated with a craft or a vessel. Um, descriptions that draw a firm comparison between the angel and its modern counterpart, an alien. So the two terms are um, actually interrelated. As we can see on this slide here, the daemon and the angel, um, uh, variously a jinn, um, they're very closely identified and of, often the symbolism is, uh, is actually grouped together. Now the ideas that the gods are reptilian and repugnant to look at is not, um, yeah I just, um, sorry about this, my, my slides were sort of, um, they, they were actually listed but they're not listed on here so it's a little bit different, di difficult trying to um, um, Catch, catch up with what the slides are saying. So, let's have a look. Um, now, careful examination of um, comparative etymology suggests archaically that there is little difference between a daemon, angel, and a jinn. Now, the last point may appear controversial, but is an essential part of the esoteric tradition in which the watcher, variously a dragon, is identified with a deity or a god, as already referred to in the Testament of Amran. Um, the watcher is described both as a viper, so he's described as reptilian in appearance, he has a terrifying countenance, so obviously this um, is relating to the um, representation of a god. Theos, a god in Greek, Dios, which is um, fear. Same within the Hebrew as well, Yahweh or Yare, and uh, which is to be afraid. So um, to so to understand what Amram meant by his definition of a watcher, we first need to carefully examine the evidence compiled from the linguistic record. Um, inherent similarities evident within related etymologies suggest that what Amram refers to as a watcher, described variously as a viper, is identical to an Elohim, a generic term translated in the plural as a deity. So the arguments for this position that the Elohim, a deity, is a seraph or a dragon, otherwise a type of angelic seraphim, they're fairly complex. And I'm going to go through the etymologies to try and substantiate this um, argumentation. But I'm quickly just going to look at the um, symbol of the Illuminati, which is the all-seeing eye, because I, I think it actually tells us very much about the nature of this um, phenomenon. As we can see etymologically, Erin, which is the Hebrew word for a watcher or a shining one, they're polymorphic words again, so the shining one or the Shining eye are often interrelated within symbolism. Um, it's a cognate of ayin and ai and awim, which is a serpent or a destroyer. As we said before in the Greek, drakon, uh, which relates to drakos, which is an eye. So this is a reptilian eye or an eye which um, refers to the daemon, the jinn, or a type of deity. Um, and it's certainly within the Semitic languages um, a cognate of Elohim, which is a plural titular for the gods. Now, the gods themselves are typically represented in the Illuminati. This is a Latin word from those who are illuminated, referring to the shining ones. But the term Illuminati actually um, originates from the Arabic word, Axori, which were the brothers of light. Now, the term Axori is a corruption from the Aramaic root. Originally, they were, were referred to as Akzari. And the Akzaris were the brothers of angels. But as we said before, the Aramaic word for Zari is polymorphic. And so therefore, they are referred to variously as the brothers of aliens. They are one and the same thing. And therefore, light, which is a signifier of the watchers or the shining ones, a type of deity, is also used to refer to this alien bloodline, which is personified or represented as a dragon. As we said before, the seraphim themselves are connected with shaf, which is the verb to see, and seraph of fire. So we are not just here dealing with an angelic tradition, but we are also dealing here with um, 
an alien tradition, and this is an occult tradition, because the word occult means to conceal or to hide. And when we transfer this into Arabic, the word jen, um, sorry, jinn, which is a type of supernatural entity, is related to jana, which is to hide or to conceal. So the occult tradition, personified with the eye, is the traditions of the jinn or the fallen angels, the deities, which is represented by the symbol of the pyramid and the all-seeing eye. Incidentally, the Arabic word aram, a pyramid, is identified with uh, harim, uh, which are the female quarters, and this relates to the human angelic offspring, which are represented as the monarchical offspring. Um, Arcos, for example, Arcos, um, a sovereign, and Ukos, which is a ve vessel, Malak, an angel, Melek, a king. Uh, we have Sultan, related to Shaitan. So um, these are esoteric signifiers of this human angelic bloodline. So, um, quickly, um, so therefore, in the Hebrew language, Erin a watcher and its occult symbol Ayin and I is a cognate of Awim a serpent, a name symmetrical to the Elohim, um, the plural titular for the gods, literally those who are high, a homonym translated also as the shining ones. So those who are high, the Elohim, are also referred to as the shining ones, otherwise a seraph or a seraphim. The definition of the Elohim as the lofty or lustrous ones is a designation aligned linguistically to the angelic sailors and their cohorts, the seraphim, a name obtained from the Hebrew root serepha, which is fire. Um, and I think we went through those etymologies on that slide. So I'm quickly going to have a look now at the symbolism here. We have um, a depiction of the Virgin Mary. Uh, we have the symbol of the diamond as well. Uh, in the Greek, Adamos is that which is unvanquished or unconquered, which is this um, da uh, daemonic race or this alien race, however you want to phrase it. Uh, we have, again, the eye, the all-seeing eye, a representation of a deity or, or a jinn or a daemon, the seraphim. And we see that this conduit is going into the womb of the Virgin Mary. So we're seeing here that this is really understood fundamentally as a type of um, birth of a type of deity, something which is angelic or alien as the two terms. Are, um, as the two terms are interrelated. So there is then this interrelationship between Theos a God, Theotes a divinity, and Theros a watcher. As we said before, the relationship was found with the seraphim and the verb shaft to see. Um, but again, within the Greek, there's this relationship with the etymology phos light and Therion a beast. Now, because Therion etymo etymologically is identified with Theoros a watcher, the beast is understood to be a sentinel, and the sentinel is a dragon. Dra um, Dracon, which is a sentinel or a watcher, Dracos, which is an eye. And here we also see that um, in the backgrounds we have um, pages, and these pages are carrying what appear to be eggs. The egg is used um, in the hieroglyphic to represent the goddess Isis. So this is a divine birth related to the Egyptian symbolism of a type of jinn. And again, the jinn is making appearance in the background, um, which is um, planting its eggs within the basket, which is the basket is a metaphor of the womb. The womb is um, uh, the egg is a metaphor for this divine birth, this birth which is non-human. So, um, philologically, Theros, a watcher, is embodied in the arcane, sorry, in the arcane traditions as Therion, a wild animal or a beast, and the connotation in the classical Greek is of a dracon, a word which is derived from the root to watch or flash, a type of seraphim. This entity is pictured as an observer correlated with a god or a deity, and is a resemblance evident also in the Semitic vocabulary. So the terms god, deity, daemon, jinn, seraphim, angel, these are all very closely interrelated. Now both in the Greek and in the Semitic, a watcher is denotive of the dragon from the verb dirk, to see, and drakos, I. So we're going to now look at the comparison in the Greek and the Hebrew regarding the etymology of god represented as a dragon. Again, these are what I refer to as polyglottal puns, um, glotta is the Greek word for a tongue, so um, poly, polos, many, many tongues, these um, etymologies are found um, within many, many different languages. I mean, I, 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 also, I, I mean, my wife is Japanese, and I'm finding the same word plays also in the Japanese as well, so this is just universal. But to be specific to this lecture, uh, we see here that we have the Hebrew word Elohim, God, is equated with Theos, God. Um, 
Erin is a watcher or a shining one. In the Greek, it's Theros, a watcher, but an etymolo etymology closely related to phos, which is light. Again, light is sig um, significant because um, the dragon etymology comes from the verb to see or to flash. So light is a signifier of the dragon. Um, in the Hebrew, Elohim is a cognate of Awim or Ayahim. These are both the plural term for a serpent. And we find the same relationship also within the Greek between Theos, God, and Therion, which is a beast, which is a type of watcher, essentially. Um, Can I just ask something? Yeah, sure. You, you, you mentioned Elohim, but the mm. Hebrew plural is him, isn't it? So why do we say God when it's God? I don't understand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, the Elohim is used in an honorific sense to refer to a, a, a deity. Um, but you are right. E essentially, the terminology is plural. And in the original context, it well, was referring both to the gods in a plural sense, but was also used in a honorif honorific sense as well. But you're right that there has been a, an attempt to masquerade um, essentially what are separate and considered to be daemonic forces are separate entities which were represented as the jinn or angels and then to try and amalgamate themselves into this one large godhead or figure which we find um, throughout all of the main religions. But I want to now just identify that the, um, the Hebrew word, and as we said, it, the wordplay transferred in, in the Hebrew between a, um, a god, a watcher and a serpent which is essentially a dragon within the Greek but the same word plays are found in the Teutonic languages as well. God is related to Gad, which is from an old root to watch. And gold, well, is a reference to, an, uh, to the old root to, to shine, or is related to light. And we see here the Masonic um, symbolism as well. So we have the all-seeing eye with G, which arguably is God, or Gnosis, um, but is, um, again, identified with um, angels, and this is a type of covenant. So the covenant is between human beings and this angelic agency, which is found in the etymology of government. Government coming from gubernatio, um, to steer a boat or a vessel, because um, the governments are mapped out according to this human angelic lineage, which, as we referred to before, we have the upper house and the lower house. The lower house represents this human element. Um, in the Hebrew also, so we have um, uh, the shaitani, which refers to an opponent or an adversary. Now, shaitan um, is connected. At, uh, originally, it was used also to refer to a party member or a partisan. So we see that there's this relationship between the partisan and shilton, uh, which is a government, because the fallen angels are connected to the bloodline of the monarch. And this is how it's... Um, at least conceptualised within the symbolism. And so therefore, state is identified with stratos, the old etymology for the angelic host. So the governments themselves are uh, mapped out according to the heavens. And we find this also religiously as well. Religare is to moor a ship or a vessel. Uh, the Greek word for a sanctuary, naus, which is a sanctuary, is related to nos, which is um, a, a ship or, or, or a vessel. So the um, sanctuaries themselves were often um, represented with both signifiers to represent this angelic agent. So observations of related vocabulary show that a watcher is identical to a god, an entity equated with a radiant serpent depicted in biblical discourse as a seraphim. In the esoteric tradition, the veneration of the dragon is associated with the emulation of a votive and is parallel to the materialization of a god. For example, in the Hellenistic mysteries, the Greek noun theos a god um, Aka Theros, a watcher, is visualized as Therion, a beast, which is a type of dragon, and is an entity that is concordant with Thusia's sacrifice from Thuo to kill or to slay. So this is where, now where we're getting into the occult tradition of the angels and how they are interlinked with um, blood sacrifice. So Controversially, I'm going to show that the juxtaposition between a deity and a votive is likewise identical in the UFO tradition and is furthermore encoded in the etymology grey, denoting an alien employed as a generic term. The grey is a class of being that in the urban and rural <coughs> mythology is attributed with animal mutilation. So we're seeing that there is this relationship um, also um, with blood. And, and again, why are the aliens taking... Um, our, all these different species from the planet. They don't need to do this. They're technologically advanced. I would suggest to the audience that they're doing this because they're saying to the leaders of the world, 
we rule this planet, you are a resource, and they are sending out a message. They're not sending out a message to the common man, but they are sending out a message, and it's a very clear message. Um, now, the proposition that the grey alien is the same type of being, which I contend is the same type of being as a watcher, um, and by very definition a deity, because these terms are interrelated, um, it is something which will obviously challenge the audience. But I'm going to try and substantiate this um, hypothesis, and I think it's a very strong hypothesis, and we can substantiate this through the study of etymology, through the study of words. So I'm going to now show you the polyglottal pun which links a grey with the watcher or a type of deity. So I'm going to show these together, and, and again, the symbolism of the Nosferatu vampire, I'm going to argue, is an occult signifier, and it's actually referring to this type of being. So I need you now to, um, perhaps, to open your mind to possibilities, and to go to areas that perhaps you've never even contemplated before in relation to this, because there is a very strong occult dimension to this phenomenon. We see that Theos the God is related to Theros the Watcher, Phos Light, and Thuos the Sacrifice. Um, that's the Greek etymology. In the Aramaic, Elohim a God is related to Erin a Watcher, Erin a Shining One, Halal Lawful. Now the, Aramaic, um, the Arabic word Halal Lawful is coming from the Arabi Aramaic etymology, Elo, the singular form for a God or a deity. Um, but it's rendered in the Arabic as Allah. Um, also within the Teutonic languages, God is related to God, which is the old root to watch, Gold, which is equated to light. Guild, um, which is the old root, root to make a sacrifice or to redeem. Uh, we would talk about a guild as a messianic guild. And indeed, the um, etymology for a builder is often equated to an angel. Uh, but we can see that the etymology here, guild, a sacrifice, is referring to the builders. And the builders are, representation, uh, are represented as angels. We would refer to the rites of Freemasonry. Again, this is the same esoteric signifier. Now, let's look at the grey. We have greys, um, which is um, identified with gaze to watch because they are watchers. Uh, they're equated to glaze or gloss, which is luster, which is to shine. And greys, which is to feed or to cut. It's a polymorphic word. So we're seeing that there is this, if you like this, these esoteric signifiers which are highly suggestive of this occult tradition and indeed if, if the greys themselves are identified with the gods and the gods instit instituted sacrifice then this tells us something about um, these beings and um, it, it tells us quite a lot about these beings now, going back to biblical symbolism, we can see um, that Ostis, the angelic host, um, which, as I said before, is literally an invasive army, but in the Semitic Sabaoth refers to Sebet, which is a crew of a vessel. Um, but in the um, Latin, Hostis, the angelic host, um, is a cognate of Ostia, a, a victim of a sacrifice. So once again, um, these angels or aliens, because the two terms are synonymous in the Aramaic, are related to sacrifice. And I, and I don't think that there's any... Once you look at the language, there's no controversy about this. Um, and it points conclusively within the occult tradition of the killing of a tribute ascribed to the veneration of angelic beings, entities that are conceptualised archaically as crew members of vessels, which obviously relates um, to the modern phenomenon of... Of, um, um, of aliens. The linguistic evidence, I would argue, suggests that there is a close link between the Elohim gods and the serpent featured typically as a seraphim uh, and is a type of angel or a species that shares close philological ties with the jinn, um, an entity articulated in the contemporary idiom as a grey alien. So quickly, we can see on this, this is this image on the slide refers to a Roman altar. We see that the serpent is related to um, types of um, types of tributaries, type of votives. But again, we see that there is this relationship also with the shaitan, the other fallen angels, and shatan, uh, which is a drinker. So in the occult tradition, the drinking of blood, Hebrew shatan, a drinker, is attributed with the shaitan, a fallen angel, and draws interesting parallels both with the rites of blood sacrifice in extension to the worship of a deity and animal mutilation. So these two phenomena, I'd say, are actually very closely related. And they are associated with alien beings or angelic beings, depending on which terminology you prefer. And although a disputed subject within the exopolitical sciences, the confirmation that aliens drink blood is twofold. So, number one, the deities themselves are equated with blood drinking and the institution of sacrifice. So, in other words, a god, the gods instituted blood drinking, they, they instituted sacrifice. Two, the representation of a deity fits the general profile of an alien, an idiom employed in the Aramaic language to denote an angel, literally a crew member of a vessel. For example, Zarian angel, which also refers to an alien, um, 
also is a being which is sourced from Sira, which is a boat. And I just want to quickly look at uh, the esoteric symbolism of the vampire, because, for example, in Stephen King's Salem's Lot, uh, which, is a, um, which is basically, we can see that the vampire superficially looks like a grey alien. But there are also um, other occult clues to the um, um, to the vampire. So, for example, we see that his eyes are depicted as shining. Remember, in the Hebrew, Erin is a watcher or a shining one. We have, um, typically, the grey alien is identified with the symbolism of the serpent or the dragon. Therefore, we see the pointed teeth, which are really a representation of the serpent. Now, within Greek symbolism, the gorgon, gorgos, which means terrible again, same idea, which is equated with the serpent, um, there was, uh, the, the Greek deities were represented with the tongue extended, but it's the same signifier. Um, now, in the Nosferatu vampire, the vampire has a pointy nose because Afra, a viper in the Arabic, is related to Af, which is, a, which is a nose. And so, therefore, within occult symbolism, typically the vampire is depicted with a very long pointy nose, um, which, is, which is depicting this accentuated sense which they have. And, and they do, um, apparently, they have a very developed sense of smell, or serpents have a, um, a developed sense of smell. Now, going back to the Nosferatu film in 1922, we see that the name of the vampire in Nosferatu is Orlok and it's um, a derivation of the Hebrew noun Orek Artri and is related to the Akkadian noun Uruk a vampire, Arabic Uruk of Ain. so there is a, an obvious play on the English noun, uh, there is obviously this play on the English noun Warlock which again uh, relates to the occult tradition so I find that it's very strange that the producers of the 1922 film Nosferatu at the turn of the century would choose an obscure Babylonian name to actually name their vampire, I think that's very interesting um, so I want, I want to just um, go on to the symbolism of the skull because I, I think that the skull itself is obviously it's used as a vanitas symbol it's, it's used to refer to our, um, our mortality but it's, been also, it's also used in the esoteric tradition as a double signifier to refer to an alien and I refer to these types of symbols um, as duplex symbols so they, they're signifying two ideas, two simultaneous ideas. We have the Adamic bloodline, which is represented with the skull, but the skull is typically combined with the worm or the serpent. Remember that the Arabic word, word for um, a worm is jen, which is equated with jinn. Um, again, skull is a word play on skolex, which is the Greek word for a worm. So the skull and worm are often interrelated, and, and it's a signifier of the dragon or the serpent. Um, so, yeah, so I want to now go on to, um, I want to look at Timothy um, Good's um, recent book, An Alien Enterprise, because here we have apparently an alleged case of a grey alien talking about how they actually feed. Obviously, I have no idea whether this is true or not, but I would say from an anecdotal perspective that what the alien is talking about fits with what we know in terms of the occult symbolism of the dragon and the profile of these angelic or alien beings. Now, so although we can say that the account is largely uncorroborated, it is a f fascinating as it explains how these beings feed, and if the source is legitimate, draws a strong parallel with the deity and the practice of bloodletting addendum to an alien being. The grey alien told Thomas the following relevant information, to quote the author Timothy Good. So he said, you have been wondering... Um, if we feed and how we do so. We know your seniors have not told you. Knowledge is important to our life, and we feed on blood and water. Yes, I can feel your reaction. Now, these beings are telepathic, just as the jinn are telepathic. Um, I can feel your reaction. Um, but our race does not digest solids. Both liquids are available on this planet, and we partake of small amounts of each in order to survive. Your seniors obtain enough food for our needs and provide us with it in your absence, as did the priesthood in the ancient world. So I think that that's actually um, very interesting, um, as it fits within the occult tradition of the serpent. So... I just want to summarise that the definition of a god in the ancient world is related to a reptile or a radiant serpent, an animal that is said in the occult tradition to drink blood. Furthermore, the entity is visualised as a crew member of a naval vessel and is non-human or repulsive in appearance. In other words, they are alien in appearance. Now, the comparison to the modern UFO tradition is thought-provoking, particularly when compared to contemporary case studies of alien abduction and mutilation. So again, we're finding that there is a general profile or a general pattern. The UFO researcher Bud Hopkins notes that in many cases, the alien being observed um, also appear to glow. So I now want to draw 
find some contemporary sources of these um, alien beings. We have a lot of sources, obviously, from the Bible and apocryphal literature, but I now want to try and compare this in terms of contemporary um, representations of these beings and see if there are general patterns that we can study. So the quotation that I'm about to quote is from a, a boy which was witnessed um, and although disturbing, is particularly interesting as it demonstrates the connection between a shining being in the biblical tradition as seraphim or a deity and in its modern depiction as a grey alien. So I'm saying that these are obviously related phenomena. I have highlighted the key words in the text for the audience. So, uh, this is what this boy said about this grey alien. He said, it was short and had big eyes. It also seemed to have an aura of some kind or, or some kind of glow around it. I don't think I could move while it was there. Well, the jinn also um, are said to be able to control people's thoughts and to um, have powers, to exercise power over people's minds. It seemed to speak, um, and it seemed to know my brother, but I don't know what it said. It appeared to come out of the wall behind the dresser, and that's the way that I I think it left. It was very frightening. Now, it, uh, this being has spirit-like characteristics. Now, as I said before, and I and will try and touch upon this when I finish the lecture, I think these are physical beings, and they're using way, um, they are using waveform, or they're somehow interacting with reality, and they're interacting at subtle levels of reality. And the etymology for jinn in the Aramaic means the spirit. And I actually think um, this is why these beings are sometimes represented in the occult tradition with the skull, um, because the, they look skeletal in appearance. And so, therefore, the etymology of a spirit would actually fit this very well, because when you look at these beings, they are skeletal in appearance, they sometimes shine, they can walk through the world, but we know that they are physical, in the same way that a human being is multidimensional, is both physical, physical and, and as a soul. Now, we can see from the quotation that this entity meets the general criteria for a watcher, daemon or a deity. And number, two, number one, it has big eyes and is suggestive in the occult tradition of a watcher. Number two, the being emanates light possessing a radiant aura around it, reminiscent in the biblical accounts of a seraphim. And number three, the entity is repulsive and is considered as frightening or alien in appearance. I have another image on the left. Um, this was produced by um, the Betty Anderson case. Actually, um, her name is interesting because Anderson means the son of man. Um, but she said here, and I've highlighted this um, in red, it says, um, white glowing clothes that blended with the surrounding light and haze. So these clothes were glowing. So again, we're dealing with a shining one. And the shining ones were the seraphim from Shaft, which is to see or to watch. Um, Dracon, again, the symbol, signifier of the watcher. Theos, a god. Um, Theros, which is a watcher. Or in the Aramaic, we have the Elohim. And the Elohim is a cognate of Erin, which is a watcher, identified with the Awim or the Ayahim. So the modern description of a typical alien is very reminiscent archaically of the Aryan, a watcher or a shining one, an entity that in the apocrypha tradition concurs with the seraphim, the highest order of angel. The seraphim is a name that is grouped semantically with the noun seraph of fire, so in other words they shine, and the verb shaft to see, um, so they are represented as a watcher or a sentinel, in other words a shining one, um, as we found within the occult symbol of the shining eye. Etymologically the seraphim is ancestral to the seraph, a radiant snake, and is an expression that is symmetrical in Quranic discourse to a jinn. And I think that this is important because um, Islamic theologians have separated the jinn from the angels and they say that they're a separate species. But when we go back into the Semitic, I think that the argument for this is very weak, and I'm going to show you why I think that this argument is weak. Um, so we see um, from quoting from the Quran in Al um, Hijjah, Surah 15, verse 26, um, Muhammad writes, um, We created man out of dry clay formed from dark mud. The jinn we created before from the fire of scorching wind. So we can see that implicit, the interpretation deduced from Muhammad's surah demonstrates that the jinn is a being created from fire. So this is obviously very important uh, because fire relates to the seraphim, an entity analogous to the angelic seraphim, the burning or flaming ones. Um, Islamic commentaries categorize angels as a separate species from the jinn and is an academic position which is shown to be tenuous. Early translations of the Tanakh, um, which is the Old Testament, but in the Tanakh we find that the word seraphim is typically translated 
in the Arabic as a jinn. And as we see here, we have a depiction of the seraphim. Again, this is working on visio as I um, as I have coined, uh, which is a visual pun. So we see that the seraphim is represented with serefa, which is fire, so the wings are fire-like in appearance. Saruf, which is burnt, which is a reference to the um, burning of the votive. Um, and we can see also that this gold background also would refer to the shining ones. And we see there that there is the, the halo around the, um, around the head of this um, angel, which would, um, is an obvious signifier of the ophanim, the circular ones, the round ones. Obviously, it's etymological to aim, uh, an angel as well, as we said that there was this um, relationship between um, the halo and the angelic lineage. Now, the grouping between the angel and a jinn, a type of seraph, is also conveyed in the Hebrew etymology of God, and once again establishes a close connection between a deity and its personification as a dragon. So this is now where we get to the meat and bones, where the deities themselves are not only represented as angels and jinn, but they are also identified um, with the gods as well. So, for example, in the Apocrypha and the Bible, the name of God, to give his full title, Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of the Host, literally Lord of a crew, of a vessel, um, is interchangeable with his earlier appellation, El Shaddai. Both titles I'm going to show are virtually identical and mean the same thing. So um, the translation of the name El Shaddai is given in the King James edition of the Bible as Almighty God. Um, furthermore, the epithet El Shaddai is alluded to in the Oxford translation of the Book of Enoch, 1912. Uh, the scholar R.H. Charles reconstruction the Lord of the Spirits. Um, which is deduced originally from the Ethiopian and Greek manuscripts and is a covert reference to the jinn in the Palestinian dialect, the Shedim. Okay, so the Lord of the Spirits would refer in, in the translation to the jinn. So, in Aramaic, the noun jinn is translated as a spirit and in Greek is usually represented as a daemon, in Christian eschatology, a fallen angel. Uh, once again, the translation of a jinn suggests a linkage with an angel, variously a deity or a dragon. Furthermore, and perhaps even more significant, the epithet Shaddai, signifying the Judaic god, is from the root shed, a demon, spirit, ghoul or ghost. The inference drawn from his name is that, the, uh, is that Yahweh himself is a type of shedim, plural, a jinn. So I'm saying that the two are actually interrelated. The terminology is virtually identical in modern Hebrew with the noun shed, a message. Um, a message. So we have shed, which is a ghost or a goblin, type of jinn. Um, shedim, uh, the collectively the jinn. Shedder, which is a message. Now, when you translate the word shedder, a message, into Greek, you get angelos, which is a messenger, which is an angel. And suggests that the angelic messengers are identical to the shedim and the jinn. Once again, I would ask the audience to refer to the screen. So if we look at the etymologies, and I just want to point out, this is a depiction of Michelangelo's angels, and we see here that the, we have reptilian scales on his back. So uh, again, there is this signifier of the serpent which is coming into, um, in, into the depiction of the angels and the seraphim. The jinn then um, is a spirit or a daemon, is related to um, a fallen angel, a seraph, um, a seraphim which is the highest order of angel, the jinn are their fallen counterpart. So we see etymologically, El Shaddai, Almighty God, Lord of the Spirits. Shaddai, Lord of the Jinn, e.g. Aramaic, a spirit, we see is related to Shedim, plural Jinn. Singular, Shed, a ghost, goblin, ghoul, or devil. So Shaddai is the Lord of the Jinn, literally. Shedder, which is a message, a term closely affiliated with Angelos, an angel or a messenger. Now, there are further interesting parallels with the Jinn, variously a spirit or a seraph, this time with the name Yahweh. Um, so we'll um, I'm going to now try and show a connection that we can see obviously that Shaddai is related to Shed which is a ghost, goblin, ghoul or a spirit but the etymology also translates with the name Yahweh because Yahweh essentially means the same thing and I'm going to show this, um, this correlation establish this correlation so according to the Bible in the book of Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 the name Yahweh is given to Moses when he asks God his name so he can communicate the information to his people to quote the book of Exodus this is the famous scene for anyone who is not familiar with the biblical story of when Moses he sees this burning bush um, he's told to take off his sh um, shoes in the presence of God and um, God describes his name and in the book of Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 God says God said unto Moses I am that I am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am have sent me unto you 
So I want to just point out the um, etymology now, and again, this is working on polymorphic language, so we're working on many different levels to try and understand the, um, uh, the encodings or the decryptions. So in the Hebrew, the name of Yahweh is rendered properly as Eya Asher Eya, as it's rendered in the Torah, and it's translated in the King James Bible as I am, that I am, but in the original Semitic, the pronoun Asher, that is polymorphic and, and can additionally be interpreted as the verbal root sanctioned. Again, Asher also refers to the original tribe of Israel. So again, there's this uh, correlation between the, lin the um, Judaic lineage and the lineage of um, Yahweh as well. Um, but we're going to keep this very simple for today's lecture. So we see that the word Asher, that is polymorphic and can additionally be interpreted as the verbal root sanctioned. Thus the name Eya Asher Eya can be read as I am sanctioned I am. The inference is that this being's jurisdiction is acquired through a political dispensation from a day which would imply a further authority, technically a Malak Elohim. So in the original um, scriptures, he's actually, um, the implication is that this deity is sanctioned. He's coming, he, he is actually, and, and again, when um, in the book of Joshua, he's referred to as the prince of the host. So again, the inference of, the, of, of his name is that he's actually working under um, the sanction of some other deity. Now, in the shortened form, the title Eya God is used to refer to a deity and is obtained from the Syrian verb Aya to be. The modern transliteration is conversant with the noun Aya a snake and Aya a goblin. So I'll just show you these etymologies. The name Yahweh to be in, in actuality specifies a type of being, which we would translate in the modern parlance as an entity, Latin entitas, from the verb ends beings. So in other words, God is saying, when he says I am, he's literally making a uh, reference to the fact that he's an entity, entitas from the verb to be. He's saying I am a type of being. Um, but when we deconstruct the etymology, we see that Eya, God, otherwise Yahweh, is related to Aya, to be, which is an entity, but is a cognate in the Aramaic of Aya, a snake, and in the Arabic, Aya, a goblin, sometimes also translated in the dictionaries as a phantom. The phantom being a representation of the jinn, which as we know can be signified with the symbol of the, um, of the skull and also so the snake with the esoteric symbolism. We know um, in, in terms of these Ubaid figurines also, we know that this is a type of shedding because of the wordplay between um, Shad, which is breast, and the shedding. So these are depictions of the shedding. So, um, so yes, so in essence, if you like, um, God is represented as a serpent, a snake, a type of goblin. And I think, again, that this fits the general profile of what we know of both the jinn, but also the profile of these alien beings, which we could argue, are serpentine in appearance. They have large eyes, as we said before. The etymology of dragon and dracos and eye um, is interrelated, is profoundly interrelated within the Semitic and the Greek language in the classical languages. So to recap, recap, the comparison to the dragon is also identical with Yahweh's other name, Shaddai, from the plural noun Shedim, a ghost, goblin, or ghoul, technically a type of jinn, and is a name which presupposes originally that Shaddai is actually a type of jinn equated with a seraph or a dragon. In the Bible, this entity is referred to as a Malak Elohim. So in other words, there's a comparison between the Elohim, which are the lofty ones, um, or in the Latin, the Nubagina, but the, the lofty ones, and there's this comparison with the Malak, which are equated also with, with the heavens, with the sky. As we said before, Malak is an, um, a polymorphic noun, which means a sailor. So these are members of um, vessels. They are crew members of vessels. So in the ancient name for God, which is used frequently in the Bible, they all have one thing in common. These are serpents, and is demonstrated in, in the wordless. And I've, um, I've, we've gone through these etymologies, but I really think it's important to underline the connection of the dragon and its representation uh, within um, religious literature and within religious symbolism. So we really do need to underline this and try and reinforce this connection. So we see um, on the wordless, Eya God, which is Yahweh, um, um, rendered as Yahweh typically, is related to Aya to be, Aya a snake, and Aya a goblin. These are interrelated. Again, superficially, it sounds very similar to uh, the grey alien. We have also the Elohim, which is identified with Erin a watcher, Ayin an eye. Arabic is related to Kayin an entity, as we said before. Um, Yahweh is in himself. The name Yahweh literally means an entity identified with Awim, a serpent, sometimes rendered as Aya, or the Ayim in the, um, in the Aramaic. 
But again, we see um, if we transfer that into the Greek, Theos a god is related to Theros a watcher. Therion a beast, which as we said is a type of dragon, from the verb to see, drakos, which is an eye. Um, but, so we're seeing then that, that god is represented as a type of watcher, a type of dragon, jinn, um, which is um, a supernatural being, jen, which is a serpent or a worm. But again, um, Shaddai himself is a type of spirit, um, is represented as um, shed, a ghost, goblin, ghoul or devil, plural shedding. And in the prologue Hebrew dictionary, the sh um, shed is rendered as a shaitani. So we're seeing that the jinn can be identified with a, sh a shaitani. And this would make sense because um, s Satan is often referred to as the, the highest angel within Christianity. The implication is that he's a type of seraphim. Now within the Islamic tradition, Iblis is said to be a type of jinn. And if Iblis is the same as Satan, which most traditions argue that these are one and the same being, then he is simultaneously being referred to as the seraphim in his in his heightened state, in his um, original state, and then when he fell as a type of jinn. Um, now, again, as, as I want to just clearly articulate, the dragon, which as we said is equivalent to a jinn or a seraphim, is related to dirk, which is the verb to see or to watch, Dracos, which is an eye. And just to bring this into the contemporary idiom, we see that there's this relationship between the greys and the etymological connection between gaze and watcher. I would argue that this is not coincidental. This is the priesthood at work again. This is the occult um, representation of um, the, the phenomenon that we describe um, as, as alien. And we're seeing this in play within the modern etymologies. Um, so... So yes, so to recap, recap, the comparison to the dragon is also identical with Yahweh's other name, Shaddai, from the plural noun. Yeah, we went through that. Uh, I, I want to also look then. So we talked about that there is this close relationship between... Um, the gods and the dragons, which are represented variously as spirits, sometimes represented in a skeletal form, uh, which is this depiction um, of these grey aliens, which, which fits with the symbology. Um, but now I want to draw in comparison with the angels, because not only are the deities and the gods and the jinn represented as um, types of dragons or serpents, but we find the correlation also with angelic names as well, which would suggest that there's this profound, a very close tie between a deity within the ancient languages and a type of angelic being. So let's look at the comparisons between an angel and a serpent. So we have in Arabic and in the um, original Semitic languages, seraphim, the highest order of angel, seraph, a serpent. As we said before, they're connected to safina, which is a type of ship or a vessel. Kaaba, an emissary or a messenger, um, an angel. Um, so in the Kabbalistic traditions, the emissaries or messengers type of angel is identified with the old Semitic noun Keb which is a serpent. In the modern Arabic this would relate to the word Kab which is a coil. In Latin Angelus an angel is a cognate of Angui a serpent. Um, in the um, Aramaic and Hebrew again Erin a watcher or a shining one as we said Theos a god and um, Theoros, which is a watcher, so a god or a shining one is equated with the Awim, which is a serpent, and again the connection between the Elohim, which is a lofty or a shining one, and the Malak Elohim, which is a type of angelic deity, which is typically figured as a type of seraphim. And if we want to be trying try to be clever with this to fit this in to the uh, modern idiom, we could refer to a gr um, the Greys collectively, and this etymology is, is uh, Pundigrian on the word glaze or gloss, uh, which refers once again an esoteric signifier to the shining ones. The shining ones represent the watchers. Hence, um, greys can be related to gaze, which is to watch. So, um, so we went through those comparisons. Um, so, essentially, the dragon is a representation of the seraphim. The seraphim are identified with the jinn, which is a type of serpent. Uh, again, is fit, uh, fits in very closely within the representation of a type of deity, both in the Greek and the Aramaic etymologies. So, um, we can see... Um, to summarise thus far, we can say the following relevant points about the veneration of non-human deities foremost. We can say that the dragon um, is deemed as a type of god or a watcher and are terms that are closely equated in the ancient languages with a seraph or an angel in contrast to the relegation of a daemon or a jinn. So this is um, in its fallen state. Number two, the progeny of the watcher's jurisdiction to rule over mankind. We know this um, both um, through the apocrypha texts of Amran but also within the Bible as well that um, 
um, El Shaddai as jurisdiction to rule over mankind. Lastly, the angelic hosts are deemed as crew members of naval vessels and are considered as an occupying force. In both angelic and alien encounters alike, the watchers are represented as reptiles or serpents and are strange or terrifying in appearance. Again, when we look at this um, symbolism, this comes from a grave and we have um, what is um, this serpentine being. But we see that this um, tail of the serpent is um, depicted as a circle, which is a representation of the ophanim, those of the wheels, those of the circular ones. This is a type of angelic vessel. As we said before, um, the seraphim is identified with sap and a sailor, um, equated with um, Safina a ship. As we said in, in, in the Greek also, the archons. Archons relates to archos, which is a ruler. We have an archangel. And these are all cognates of ukos, which is a large vessel um, in the Greek language. Uh, typically, scholars here, and this is interesting, and this is where I would um, part company in terms of this, they say that Mother Earth is giving the child to the priestess. I would say, actually, it's the other way around. We know that um, what's happening here is that the child has been sacrificed to this um, serpent deity. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that we also have another Vizio Paranamasia pun. We have the finger here, which is going across his lips. But I would argue that the finger in, in this context is used to refer to the serpent's tongue. So the, this is the tongue of the serpent. And we're seeing that he's holding... Um, some type of Cyril Khan. Well, the etymology in the Palestinian dialect for the Dagon, which was a type of um, fish deity, Dag, which is a fish, um, in the Greek is rendered as Dagon, which is, refers to um, Cyril crop or grain. So the grain is often a signifier of the dragon. And again, this relates to the fact that these beings gave mankind agriculture. They gave man knowledge. And this is very important to appreciate and to understand. And again, it's fitting in with the general profile or pattern that we know that these beings um, drink blood, or that sex of um, these being straight blood and um, is interrelated both within um, let's say the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition and, and the Judaic tradition in which sacrifice formed a very prominent part of um, ritual equated to the worship of God but we find the exact opposite also uh, with the worship of uh, the shaitani the shaitani, in, the shaitani is often depicted with the eye signifier the motive of the watchers but we find this also within Catholicism the all seeing eye within um, Catholicism so I would argue that they're actually controlling the discourse and they're, they're controlling both sides of the discourse and they're doing this very cleverly and that I would say that they've, in, they've intercepted human language and they've, in, they've inserted themselves into human languages and the more you study language the more you realise that certain words which have um, phonetic similarities to other words that they it exerts a psychological influence over the mind so the mind can be controlled very profoundly through language and it is subjected to um, subliminal symbolism so <laughs> Throughout the course of this lecture, we've taken the time to analyse ancient etymologies regarding the angel. And we've said that the angel is related to the alien, and the alien is identified with the watcher, obviously with the dark eyes, which fits into the symbology of the dragon. Um, in the bi biblical tradition, the Judaic name of God, originally Ayah, an entity, is correlated in Arabic with Ayal, a goblin, from the ancient root Ayah, a serpent. So in other words, the representation of um, the gods, or God, within the Arabic, fits within the profile of what we know about a watcher, that the, um, the, the grey aliens themselves, well, they are very goblin-like in their appearance. They do appear like phantoms. They appear almost in a skeletal form. And we can see that there is this connection be between this idea that they can walk through walls, that they can shine. But we also know that they're physical beings because they can materialise physically. Uh, and we mentioned the point that Aya God is consistent with the earlier classifications of El Shaddai, the Lord of the Spirits, a name cognate with the Shedim, a goblin, ghost, ghoul, or a jinn. As we said, this terminology can also be translated as a shaitani, um, which fits with the general profile of a grey alien. And lastly, the comparison of a deity to a dragon is identical in Greek with the etymology of a god associated with a watcher, an angel, or a daemon, and is a definition onomatologically approximate to a grey alien. So by this I'm saying um, that there are linguistic patterns within word groups, related etymologies, which show us quite clearly what this phenomenon is. And I've heard a lot of people um, throughout perhaps... Um, throughout various conferences, saying, well, you know, this is something that we can't understand and it's something we'll never know and it's beyond the realm of knowing. Well, I would say that actually there is a lot that we can find out about this phenomenon and one of the ways that we can do this is through the study of linguistics. So I'm actually very optimistic that we can actually find answers and solutions to some of these problems.
The four main points are as follows. Number one, the dragon describes a watcher or a shining one, and it's manifested as a deity. And in the contemporary idiom, this fits the general profile of a grey alien. And in terms of the tradition of the jinn, we know that the jinn um, can control and manipulate people's thoughts, they can control people's ideas. Um, so we know that this fits the general profile. We know that there's strong circumstantial evidence which suggests that the angels and their modern counterpart aliens are equated with blood sacrifice and animal mutilation. And I know that this theme... Um, um, has um, created a massive division within both within ufology, within the occult, because we've got one side of the argument saying, well, gosh, you know, the aliens, aren't they so nice and spiritual and lovely? And when we've got the other side saying, no, they're all blood-sucking reptilians. I'm actually arguing that, I'm arguing here that these beings are controlling both sides of the discourse and they're actually manipulating the language and the terms which we are using in order to inform our understanding of what these beings are. So there's a very subtle manipulation which is occurring. Um, number three, in the biblical tradition, the Judaic name of God, originally Ayah, an entity, is correlated in Arabic with Ayal, a goblin, from the Aramaic root Ayah, a serpent. So these beings take on um, an appearance which is serpentine in appearance. The serpent is a cognate of the dragon, which is a watcher. In the Greek, um, Theos God, Theros a watcher, as we said, is identified with Therion, which is a beast. And lastly, the comparison of a deity to a dragon is identical in Greek with the etymology of a god associated with a watcher, angel, or a daemon, a terminology which is translated um, in the Arabic as a jinn. So these, this phenomenon is clearly related. Um, so this, uh, we have here a depiction of... Um, um, some type of deity which comes from Yugoslavia but I put this in because it's very ancient it's 5,000 years old um, and again superficially it shows us superficially what a grey alien looks like and this is where it's important for us to begin to appreciate occult symbolism because when we come to UFO conferences the general consensus is well gosh this only started like 60 years ago and no one has actually bothered to look at the occult symbolism but within the occult symbolism uh, this phenomenon is clearly embedded and as I said before the terminology occult comes from the root um, um, occult is related to ocular which is the eye and, and to conceal as well and and when we transfer this into the Arabic, jinn and jana, which is hide or to conceal. So this is a concealed tradition appertaining to the jinn. Um, and this phenomenon just didn't, um, just, it didn't arrive um, out of nowhere. This has been here for thousands of years. So this is important for us to understand this. Um, and to summarise some of the main arguments, in relation to um, these alien beings, we, in the modern idiom we talk about spaceships. But they were talking about um, this idea within the Aramaic. Zari, an angel or an alien, identified with Sira, a boat or a vessel. So these beings were identified with vessels. Um, Seboeth, Sebet, a crew of a vessel. Um, we're finding this also within the Greek etymologies. Archon, which is a type of entity, which is very similar to a type of jinn. Ukos, which is a large um, vessel. So these beings clearly are articulated with vessels. And it's a misunderstanding for us to just say, well, the UFO is only a modern construct, and it's a construct from a technological age. Um, I think it, it, clearly it is not. And again, when we talk about disclosure, well, if we took the um, modern idiom disclosure and we transferred that into Greek, we would have um, the apocalypse, because the ap apocalypse is the unveiling, and we are living in these times now of the unveiling, uh, where this... Um, the tradition about the jinn, the tradition about the fallen angels, is being um, um, deconstructed very carefully. And again, within um, Islamic discourse, the secret tradition um, um, referring to the jinn and referring to all of this is known as Wuju al Quran. Literally, Wuju al Quran talks about the forgotten recitation. The forgotten recitation. The, the etymology is polymorphic. It, it can also mean a facet as well. So this is um, the forgotten rec recitation. Literally in the Arabic means a polymorphic word because the Quran is written in polymorphic language. It is an occult document. It is layered. It is esoteric. And in order to understand the Quran, you have to study linguistics, etymology. And there are also numerical codes within the Quran as well. So it's a very complex and a very layered document. Five minutes, okay. Um, so, to summarise some of these points, I just want to make that singular, the definition of a spaceship is not, that, um, is not as is generally believed in the exopolitical community, a relatively modern concept. Um, at the beginning of the lecture, um, I quoted Nick Pope. Um, he's, he's just wrong on that. 
Okay? Um, and I think this was obviously um, related to Vallée's work, um, Jacques Vallée, because he talked about this control structure. But essentially, um, the idea of a spaceship is a very ancient idea. This idea that the entities are related to the circular ones, the Ophanim, um, angelic vessels, very ancient idea. So behind the facade of an alien vessel is a much older and an arcane uh, mythology, a theme which is theologically entrenched with the veneration of the gods. The deities recorded in the religious canon are virtually identical to the type of entities described in modern experiences as a grey alien. So the two phenomena are interconnected. In both of these cases, strange are alien beings are typically associated with luminescent vessels uh, that originate from the sky. According to religious scriptures, the dragon is a class of deity and is a progenitor in the Aramaic language of Zari, an angel or an alien, possesses, which possesses absolute control over mankind. So this is what cattle mutilation is about. They're telling us something. They are saying, we have control over your resources. And I think that these beings have planted their seed on many different planets. And what they're using, they're using, um, a, it's like a giant computer program. So they're using... Um, they're using different systems um, and, um, to try and uh, mine the most valuable uh, resource in the universe. And the most valuable resource in the universe is not oil, despite what everyone else thinks. It's intelligence. And this is what they're mining. They are mining intelligence, and they are doing it through emergent systems. They are doing it through evolution. And evolution manifests itself. It has an inherent wisdom. And, it's, and these beings are mining that intelligence. And therefore, they are purposely creating division and conflict, because they are trying to facilitate emergent systems. And I think that this is what we're finding within the traditions of the shaitan as well, the, um, the opposers, those who, who um, are the adversaries. And again, the, the term relates to the political system, because we have a bipartisan political system, that which represents the human lineage, and then we have the angelic lineage or the monarchical lineage. Um, and I just want to just quickly then um, finish with a quote. So evidence indicates that this agency intervenes, intervenes globally in human affairs and asserts its rule over mankind. So it has done this religiously, it's done this ideologically. Marx and Engels, well Engels is the Anglo-Saxon word for angel, uh, Marx is the old word for a Martian. What is a Martian? Well, if we go into the Hebrew, Adam um, is, is man or humanity. Machadim is Mars. So there's this connection between humanity and Mars, which is found within the esoteric tradition. So Marx and Engels is a play between the Adamic lineage and the angelic lineage. So we're finding these J. Edgar Hoover, um, Jehovah. So just to finish with one last um, quote. Sorry, I, I've got to tie this up really quickly now because... Uh, we're on overtime. So, just to quote with um, a quote from the Acts of Thomas in the Apocrypha, in the Apocrypha um, uh, sorry, in the Apocrypha Testament. So, um, this is what Thomas had to say. And the angel inquired of him, saying, Tell me of what seed and of what race thou art. And he said unto him, I am a reptile of the reptile nature, and noxious son of the noxious father. In other words, a deity or a seraphim. I am son to him that sitteth on a throne um, over all of the earth. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just uh, mention, if anyone's interested in this information, to go to my website, um, www.psabat.com, and you can find um, information about upcoming books and DVDs as well. Okay, thank you.